I'm Jacob Ross and I'm the lead ranger here at the Jimmy Carter National Historical Park and today we're gonna learn about the peanut brigade Jimmy Carter's secret weapon Jimmy Carter faced an uphill battle during the 1976 campaign for president bluntly no one outside of Georgia knew who Jimmy Carter was serving one term as a state senator and one term as Georgia governor doesn't exactly scream national heavyweight politician in December of uh, 1974 there was a major headline on the editorial page of the Atlanta Constitution that said Jimmy Carter is running for what? And the what, the what was about this day. I'm running, I'm running for president. Jimmy Carter entered the Democratic presidential race a political unknown. Outside of Georgia, hardly anyone even recognized his name. But that would change. Jimmy who? Jimmy Carter. Jimmy who? I don't know who he is. Jimmy Carter's basketball player, isn't he? How did he even stand a chance of getting elected when almost the entire country was asking the question, Jimmy who? The 1970s was the decade where political campaigns developed into a science. By that I mean, even though Jimmy Carter was a long shot candidate, Few people knew who he was, and he had an extremely small campaign budget. If he deployed the right strategies at the right time, he could still win the election. The challenge was finding the winning formula on a shoestring budget. But luckily, this wasn't Jimmy Carter's first time facing such odds as a long shot candidate. And he knew what strategy could get him across the finish line. When Jimmy ran for the state senate, um, I kept our farm supply business. I stayed at the at the uh, office of the farm supply business, and but Jimmy would go out every day and campaign, and um, he would come back with names of people, and I would write letters to them. I think he probably helped me help writing some letters, but that was my responsibility. And the children took uh, the boys took posters and nailed up posters all over town and that kind of thing, passed out some brochures in, in the uh, county around. Um, for governor, the boys um, campaigned uh, some. They were, uh, Jeff was not old enough to campaign. He was the youngest, and so uh, he went with me. And we, we drove all over the state, just going from one town to another. We got, Jimmy got in the governor's late race late, when the, um, uh, our leading Democratic candidate dropped out and, with a heart attack. And so we didn't have very long to campaign and didn't have, really didn't have time to organize or anything like that. We just, that was the first time he ran. We lost that time, ran four years later and won. And uh, we all got out and campaigned. There were no reporters, no cameras, no secret service nearby when Jimmy first walked up and introduced himself to countless voters. This style was unheard of for a presidential hopeful, but for Jimmy Carter, there was no other way. I want to be tested in the most severe possible way. I can't think of any more severe way than campaigning 250 days this year outside of Georgia or entering 31 different primaries. I want the people of this country to know my character my strengths and my weaknesses, my stand on the issues. If I can measure up to what the American people want our government to be, I'll be elected. Jimmy Carter from Georgia. I hope to be your next president. During his state senate and governor campaigns, Carter learned quickly that the most impactful way a candidate could spend his time was by hitting the streets and talking with voters directly. Political science doctor Paul Hernson wrote, Person-to-person -person communication is probably the most effective means of political persuasion and boosting voter turnout. Most campaigns believe that direct contact with voters is the best way to win votes. A firm handshake and a warm smile.
accompanied by an explanation of why one wants to serve, perhaps followed by a direct response to a voter's question, are the best ways to convey politically relevant information and to build trust, two ingredients key to winning votes. In fact, modern studies have shown that a candidate meeting with voters directly is the most effective way to convince someone to vote for them. Personal campaigning was cheap, effective, and feasible for Senator Jimmy Carter, and to some extent, Governor Jimmy Carter. But running for president offered a new challenge. The overwhelming size of the nation meant that Carter couldn't speak with every voter himself. Still short on cash, Carter took what he learned from his previous campaigns and enlisted the help of his family, friends, and other Georgians to spread the word about his candidacy and vision for good government from door to door, from shopping center to shopping center, from factory to factory. Hundreds of volunteers stepped up to the task and they became known as Jimmy Carter's Peanut Brigade. The Peanut Brigade was a group of um, volunteers who went all over the country when Jimmy campaigned for president. Uh, actually, we had a, I think we called it High Neighbor when Jimmy ran for governor uh, the, sec the, the second time when he won. It was Georgia people that traveled all over the state. And that was where the idea came from, I think. And uh, people, the Peanut Brigade was the president's race. And it was friends from, actually from Georgia to start with, and then as we gained and knew people and made uh, friends and uh, supporters in different states across the country, we had people from different states going everywhere too. It was, and we couldn't have won without them, I don't think. These volunteers faced a monumental task Hernson wrote, door-to-door -door campaigning is relatively inexpensive because volunteers carry out much of the actual labor, but it requires a core of committed volunteers. Catapulting Jimmy Carter, the long-shot candidate, into the Oval Office was going to require unprecedented commitment, sacrifice, energy, and perseverance. So who volunteered for this political cavalry from Georgia? There were five to 600 volunteers total, but the campaign was sustained by a smaller core of a few hundred. They ranged in age from 15 to 78 years old. They were both white and black and included people who were students, businessmen, housewives, retirees, and political leaders, including the lieutenant governor's wife. And just like the wide variety of backgrounds, their motivations for volunteering also varied greatly. Some volunteered because of their sincere belief that Jimmy Carter was a moral force for good and government reform after the Vietnam era and Watergate was needed. Some signed up to be involved in a once-in-a-lifetime campaign and witness history. Others wanted to explore the country, meet new people, and see a different climate. Regardless of their reasons for volunteering, once they were deployed, they were 100% dedicated to the task at hand. They had to be unwavering in their commitment. During the primary section of the campaign, the volunteers had no financial support. They had to pay for their own plane tickets, their own rental cars, their own meals, and their own hotel stays. The average volunteer spent between $1,400 and $2,300 of their personal funds if you convert it to $2021. The campaign uh, in New Hampshire housed a few local campaign workers in a dilapidated house with little heat because that's all they could afford. And even that was soon condemned when a pipe burst. The volunteers usually campaigned for a week at a time and had to leave their jobs to volunteer, a monumental feat for those who were self-employed. They endured extreme weather, like the New Hampshire blizzard that covered the roads with snow and ice, and even negative 19 degree temperatures. And that wasn't to mention the threats to bodily harm. More than one volunteer got chased up a tree by a dog. One almost walked right into the jaws of an alligator in Florida. And one team was run out of town with threats from the KKK because of Carter's belief in racial equality. Stopping at the city limits as they were leaving, one volunteer prayed that the KKK rally planned for that night would be rained out as just retribution. Then God cast his vote for Carter with a downpour of three inches of water. But don't get me wrong, even with all the challenges these volunteers faced, they had more support than one waterlogged instance of divine intervention. The Carter campaign may not have had a lot of money, but it ran like an efficient, well-oiled machine. They took the latest research in campaign science and put it into practice with meticulous planning and voter targeting efforts to make the best use of limited campaign funds and staff. Local staff working in their respective states scouted out neighborhoods and prepared for the Georgian volunteers to make the most out of their week-long blitz. 
The Peanut Brigade was given incent intensive training briefings during their entire trip to their deployment location. When they landed, they were handed detailed maps of towns and neighborhoods with targeted homes of Democratic voters and public meeting spaces, a mission itinerary, pre-organized campaign event schedules, mountains of printed literature and buttons, and most importantly, walk cards. Walk cards were used to get the most benefit out of every voter interaction. While volunteers spread the gospel of Jimmy Carter to everyone they encountered, they also collected information about each voter. Their name, address, contact information, how favorably they viewed Carter on a five-point scale, and what issues were important to them as citizens. This information was brought back to the local campaign headquarters, where it was compiled, organized, and employed to follow up with the most promising voters to maximize impact. In this way, the Peanut Brigade volunteers served the dual purpose of voter outreach and strategic research. As they split up into teams and fanned out across each state, public reception of the volunteers was overwhelmingly positive. But people generally thought they were nuts. Many of the New Hampshire voter voters invited the shivering Georgians into their homes, stating that even the hardiest granite staters wouldn't dare brave such weather. One volunteer was almost arrested when a local policeman thought that her foray into the sub-zero conditions was recklessly dangerous. When many voters learned that the volunteers spent their own time and money to do the grueling work of campaigning for between 12 and 16 hours a day, they were simply shocked. Anyone willing to work that hard and sacrifice so much for a political candidate must be representing one special man. This is what ultimately convinced many voters that Carter was worthy of their ballot. Even one of Carter's opponents, Mo Udall, kept running into Carter's volunteers and exclaimed, God, they're everywhere! The voters were not only impressed by the Peanut Brigade's volunteers, but also enjoyed their company. The Georgians' southern accents mesmerized their northern hosts. These exotic volunteers from a land far away earned instant celebrity status when voters learned of their personal friendships with the fabled peanut farmer from Georgia. The good behavior of Carter's ambassadors went a long way to convince Northern voters that this candidate was part of a new South, one where a Southern politician not only was effective at economic development, but also advocated for civil rights for all. Uh, previously, Southerners who had run for president uh, had right, uh, faced serious obstacles because uh, their states were not viewed as being highly developed economically, and they were viewed as states that had very difficult race relations. And in both areas, Jimmy Carter was seen as a great reformer. He uh, helped put Georgia on the uh, face of the map as a vibrant economy, and he also worked very hard to ensure that discrimination against African Americans and other minorities uh, was not tolerated. And so he was seen as, uh, because of his efforts in uh, Georgia, as part of the New South and kind of the alternative to George Wallace as a national candidate for president. And that helped him uh, win supporters, uh, not only in the South, but all over the country, uh, based on this record that he had established. The volunteers of the Peanut Brigade exemplified Carter's personal values, which was a force for sectional healing more than 100 years after the Civil War. The Peanut Brigade visited both white and black neighborhoods, rich suburbs and poverty-stricken ghettos, industrial factories and lone farmers in the middle of plowing their fields. The Peanut Brigade's willingness to venture to those on the fringes of society where other campaigns refused to tread spoke volumes about the care and love that their candidate had for all people. Attention from the friends of Jimmy Carter elevated the dignity of those who were too often relegated to the margins, and they remembered that on election day. Many skeptical Northerners got to see these Southerners as real people, and that dispelled long-held stereotypes. Sharing meals and laughter was often what led many to establish lifelong friendships with their Georgian brethren that extended well beyond the campaign and election. The Southerners also learned the Northerners were just as well-versed in hospitality as their hometown neighbors were. This mutual respect led Americans from everywhere to view Jimmy Carter as the first viable presidential candidate from the Deep South since the Civil War, in stark contrast to another opponent, Governor George Wallace of Alabama, who openly espoused racism and segregation. When the Peanut Brigade's victorious crusade into the Florida primary dethroned Wallace from his position as the default candidate from the South, Carter's victory gleamed as a glint of hope 
for the new South in the sun Sunshine State. A dark era in Southern politics was finally coming to an end, and this wayward region was finally reconciled with the rest of the nation after over 100 years. During the primaries, the Peanut Brigade was deployed to six states and had a considerable impact on the results. Before the nation's first primary in New Hampshire, Carter was pulling dead last in the four-way race between himself, Alabama Governor George Wallace, Arizona Congressman Mo Udall, and Washington Senator Henry Jackson. In the final days, a group of Georgia supporters, often referred to as Carter's Peanut Brigade, flew into New Hampshire. Hello, are you ready to call? Yes, yes. yes. I'm Doc Patrick, and I'm a volunteer from the state of Georgia. If we had snow on the ground like this, we'd be paralyzed for a week. We couldn't get out of the house. After two trips on January 4th through 9th and February 18th through 24th, almost 200 volunteers reached two-thirds of the state's registered Democrats. The last vote was cast and the polls were closed. As darkness fell over New England, candidates met once again with their supporters and anxiously waited for the first returns of the primary season. Jimmy Carter took a long lead tonight in the race for the Democratic presidential nomination. He won the New Hampshire primary handily. CBS News. When the official results were announced, Jimmy Carter had won 30% of the total popular vote. The New Hampshire results show that in New England, being from the South was not the handicap that many people thought it would be. Thank you very much for coming back. I've enjoyed it. Other victory celebrations would follow, but few would be as gratifying to the dark horse candidate from Georgia. I remember when we couldn't find a microphone. Carter came out on top with 28.4% plurality of the vote and 15 of the state's 17 delegates. His name was on the map and momentum started to pick up. The next stop was to Florida, where 200 Georgians invaded from the north in late February. The main goal was to unseat pro-segregationist George Wallace as the king of Southern politics. In the Florida Democratic primary of 1972, Wallace won Florida by a staggering 26.1 percentage point margin over the second place candidate, Hubert Humphrey. When the March 9th primary came, Carter came out on top by a three percentage point margin over Wallace. This moment marked the Peanut Brigade's success at making Carter a viable candidate in two distinct regions of the country. The Peanut Brigade rocketed off to Wisconsin during the first week of April, where 98 volunteers changed the course of history. On primary night, newspapers printed their front page headlines declaring Mo Udall as the winner. But the impact of the brigade's last minute blitz defied the media's expectations. It wasn't long before newspapers were pulling their publications out of newsstands to correct the embarrassing error and rename Carter as the winner. The victory certainly didn't occur because of the Carter budget. The campaign was reusing posters from the New Hampshire primary. With Carter's momentum building as a proven national candidate, late April saw the uniting of the other campaigns against Carter, whom they saw as their largest mutual threat. Fighting a forefront war in Pennsylvania, almost 100 volunteers divided into six teams and spent a week knocking on doors and speaking in union halls. For the first time, the Peanut Brigade also reached out to Republican voters, anticipating the future general election campaign. Carter won 65 of the 67 counties, and it looked like he was unstoppable. Jackson and Humphreys dropped out of the race. In mid-May, the campaign was shaken up by the entrance of two new candidates, California Governor Jerry Brown and Idaho Senator Frank Church. Uniting with the Udall campaign, they wanted to stop Carter at all costs. Before almost 100 volunteers arrived in Maryland, Carter was trailing behind Brown. Being a suburb of the Washington, D.C. establishment that Carter campaigned against, Maryland proved to be an uphill battle. For the first time, the Peanut Brigade became Carter's attack dogs armed with anti-Brown talking points. The governor openly supported Brown. The political machines in the state worked against Carter, and the local campaign was extremely disorganized. Despite all of these challenges, the brigade's efforts won Carter a majority of the delegates, but he did lose the popular vote by a margin of 12%. As the campaign steamed ahead through other primaries, it finally came down to Ohio. 
Labeled as a must-win for Carter to secure the nomination, he once again called on the peanut brigade. About 100 volunteers campaigned across the state during the first week of June, with a few crack team brigaders arriving earlier to gather reconnaissance intelligence. By this point, the peanut brigade volunteers became celebrities in their own right, being invited on their own TV and radio programs. Their enthusiasm for Carter and the election became infectious. Because of their efforts, Carter wrapped up Ohio with 52.3% of the vote and 126 of the 152 delegates. This was enough to secure the Democratic nomination and challenge President Ford in the general election. The peanut brigade continued to be a force for Carter during the general election, but some fundamental changes occurred that lessened its impact. Unlike the primary elections, all 50 states voted in the general election on the same day, so the overwhelming focus of the, of the Peanut Brigade's mission was diluted because of the dispersed nature of the national campaign. Peanut Brigade volunteers traveled to 32 states during the general election campaign. Jimmy Carter and Vice President Candidate Walter Mondale campaigned in the states that had the most electoral votes on the table, and the Peanut Brigaders were sent as ambassadors to the smaller states to let them know that they weren't forgotten. During this election, the Democratic National Committee stood behind the Carter campaign and paid for all costs associated with their volunteers' travels, minus their meals. This made campaigning more feasible for several hundred more volunteers, and the mission of the Peanut Brigade expanded from person-to-person -person contacts to also include speaking engagements, earning free media coverage, participating in campaign activities like parades and fairs, voter registration, and actually getting voters to the polls on election day. Due to many other factors at play during the national election, the deployment of the peanut brigade did not guarantee victory like it did during the primaries, but it was still effective at convincing the nation that one young man from Georgia would make a great president. Jimmy Carter won the election with 297 electoral college votes to President Ford's 240, and one rogue elector who voted for Ronald Reagan. The morning after election day, when it was clear that he was the next president-elect, he praised the peanut brigade and proudly stated, without them, I could not have won. And the adventures didn't stop there. About 8,000 Georgians attended Carter's inauguration in Washington, DC, and 382 of them made the trip with the Carters via a special chartered Amtrak train, dubbed the Peanut Special. The peanut brigade participated in a parade down Pennsylvania Avenue, pulling a giant peanut balloon behind them to celebrate their winning candidate, and the president of the people, put into office by the people. Sixteen and a half months ago, on the 20th day of January, 1975, I began to campaign for president. Recognizing that I did not hold public office, I did not have a political base, I did not have a nationwide campaign organization. We didn't have much money. We had a family and a small number of volunteers, I'm sure most of whom are in this room. And we began to go from one living room to another, one livestock sale barn to another, one union hall to another, one shopping center to another, to talk to people in this nation and to listen and to learn. Now, I want to see us once again have a nation that is good and honest and decent and truthful and competent and compassionate and is filled with love as all the American people.